That's the way the money goes from M, the project led by Robin Scott, who has some new music out, and he's my guest on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Welcome to the show, Robin. Hi there. How are you doing? Excellent. We're happy to have you here. And yes, you are known in the U.S. for pop music and other chart hits in the U.K., but what your fans born from those tracks might not know is that you've been a part of music history for decades. Many a great story with a musician, not only on this show, but during many other interviews, starts off with, the artist met Malcolm McLaren at, and then it goes on from there. It's part of your story, too. Yes, that's right. Yeah, this was going back some way to um, yeah, the, the early 70s, when we were at art school together. So how did you actually meet at the art school? Well, we were just in the, in the same class, just rubbing shoulders, and in the same year, in the same studio. And um, then uh, Vivian Westwood um, became part of Malcolm's life and um, consequently a part of mine too. And we uh, we still are in touch, Vivian and I, but obviously Malcolm's no longer with us, sadly. It was a very sad thing to hear some years back. And a lot of the people that I talked to met Malcolm when he was successful, when things were happening with him. But as you said, you met him in college. It was the, the days where students tried to do some things that were new and didn't know what they were going to turn out to be when you got older. Was there anything sort of experimental you all tried when you were in the college years that maybe would have worked out later or didn't quite work out at the time? Well, I think um, uh, in that period, art school was very much the melting pot for um, aspiring musicians as well as artists. So it was um, it was all in the mix at that time. The interests were crossing over, whether it was fashion, music, or fine art. And that kind of renaissance sort of resurgence was responsible for um, releasing a lot of activists out into the wide world. Before punk, new wave, and synth pop, you released your first single, 1969's Piano Heavy, I should say, yeah. The Sailor. Yeah, a very folk singer-songwriterish, yeah. uh, reminiscent of the time, of course. Yeah, that was, that was my first album. Yes, that came off my first album, which um, we recorded in London. Uh, it was it was done very fast, very low budget, but uh, it was a good experience. And um, uh, I didn't get back into the studio myself for some time after that. Um, I, I moved into other areas in the industry and uh, I got into forming my own label and management and all kinds of things before I reappeared with um, the new material under the um, pseudonym M. And the first album, Women from the Warm Glass, I understand it's quite a collector's item these days. That's right, yeah. it's uh, If you're fortunate enough to have a copy and you want to part with it, it's quite saleable. <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. I think it's to, partly to do, in part, to do with the fact that the it was on the label had very few releases. It was very rare, and um, yeah, I guess the, the circulation was was quite limited by the fact that the label was um, a short-lived experience. And I mean, that's how collectible records kind of develop, isn't it? They're just kind of few and far between. And if they're of some particular interest, if they capture the imagination of collectors they tend to appreciate quite seriously and vinyl of course is becoming more so and that music your music at the time was at the cutting edge of fm radio at least around here in the u.s where music like yours could get played on those stations where the mainstreamers were still on the am things that were a bit different got more popular when young people got a hold of the fm band and started listening to it a lot more so that's a good thing and and i understand you also shared shared the stage with a lot of greats like david bowie and john martin while you were sort of troubadouring if you will yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was that was the time. I mean, we were on the, the college circuit and folk clubs, and um, that was the uh, the breeding ground for um, that generation. Speaking of your generation, the voice, and I want to get into this because the BBC would always be known kind of as a, a stodgy network. It's state-owned, and, and we're always looking at uh, shows like The Good Life as an example. But there seems to have been a movement around when you were doing The Voice where they were trying to reach out to younger people. Uh, and then you had Monty Python. You had more experimental stuff like that. Talk about how you got that on the air. Well, um, I met up with... Um a kind of radical poet at the time, a guy called George Macbeth, and he was working for the BBC uh, in the sort of arts programming. And there was a, an opportunity which was offered, in fact, to Genesis at the time 
and um, to put together something within the sort of freedom of the kind of arts programming. But um, at short notice, they, they pulled out of the project and then um, George put me up for it. So then I was allowed to, I was given access to the archives and the radiophonic electronic workshop and uh, it was a great experience, actually. Yes, it was. Um, it was kind of off the wall, but um, uh, a fairly, yeah, it was a radical departure from most of the programming at the time. A lot of that was the uh, maybe the idea where maybe 10, 15 years later, you had your great shows like The Young Ones and more innovative stuff from your Ben Eltons of the world. Thanks to the fact that BBC seemed to have opened up to younger people and uh, ideas, new ideas back when you were doing The uh, the Voice. And just, a, just a thought, yeah, maybe an observation true. from outside across the pond, I guess. Yes, I think that's probably the case. Whatever happened to, and this got me curious, whatever happened to Heartaches and Teardrops, the musical you wrote? Well, there's always a, a bundle of projects, whether it's songs or ideas that um, fall on fallow ground or they never get realized for one reason or another. And in that particular instance, yeah, I put together what was um, <clears throat> basically a, an idea for um, a musical. And um, uh, it was born out of the kind of interest in the alternative to the kind of superhero Marvel comics. There was this another the other end of the spectrum, there were all these kind of, um, uh, how should I say, uh, comics which used to feature romantic um, (laughs) affairs and whatever, and the the, the actual um, illustrations were quite striking, and not not dissimilar to the uh, the source of inspiration for Roy Lichtenstein's work. And um, I used that as a basis for exploring an alternative theme to, if you like, the Rocky Horror show, which um, obviously was enormously successful. So it was uh, something which I I did pursue for some time, but sadly at the time I was um, restricted on the basis that I couldn't offer my publishing. I was not free for publishing, and um, the work that I had prepared um, was still um, under that contract, so to speak. So the... um, uh, the potential um, production house that wanted to pursue it was unable to enjoy the collateral of being able to control my life, uh, my publishing as well. So it never happened, and I, I couldn't struggle with all the kind of legal eventualities, and so I moved on. Robin Scott is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. I guess all that red tape is uh, it stops everything. Yeah, it, it, It's always in the way. Not, not a big fan of that. New Wave and Punk were on the rise later on. Your Do It Records company was at the forefront again as well, releasing tracks not only from your own R&B project, but the likes of Adam and the Ants, which incidentally is another McLaren creation. You also produced for The Slits. Again, quite different from your past music, but what attracted you to those new genres? Um, I think... Um the the whole um, opportunity that was being becoming obvious, the idea of an independent label was um, this was really early days, and um, it was simply suggested that you know one could start a, a kind of DIY scenario in one's own bedroom or whatever. Um, one just really had to understand how one could um, take advantage of. Uh, reaching out independently to distributors and um, uh, basically pressing houses for vinyl and all the rest of it. It was, it was doable, but at that time, it was very unusual for, for people to set up independently and try and um, act in a, in a, yeah, a pretty, <laughs> the music industry was a lot narrower and it was um, very much in control of of the corporate entities which um, were, you know, running the business, so to speak. But um, suddenly there was the opportunities became obvious that one could actually, if one persevered, work independently of um, the majors. And uh, the other independent label at the time, which um, took off significantly, was Stiff Records. And I'd already had um, some experience of that because I, the band I was producing, I had... Uh, released um, on the Stiff label, uh, I think it was the second release, and um, yeah, after um, 
uh, Nick Lowe's first release, I think, was the, the first uh, release on Stiff Records, and the band I was producing was the second release. I was just kind of in the right place at the right time, but then I went independent with my own label, which was Do It. Chris Cordani here with Robin Scott, singer, songwriter, producer, musical writer, and innovator, known to many of you as M, the leader of the M Project. He's with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Straight ahead, we're going to talk about his breakthrough hit, Music After M, and a new single along with a new album. The Sailor, that one from 1969 by Robin Scott, better known to fans of New Wave as M. He's here with me now. Robin, let's hit 1978. You created the M Project. What was your vision for that? What were some of your influences at the time? Well, at this time, I was just on the cusp of leaving this managerial role in the business, which I had been doing for a couple of years at the same time as managing my independent label. And um, I was in Paris where I was recording and filming a band called The Slits, which um, was uh, a female band, probably the only female band in London that had such such notoriety alongside The Pistols. And... um, uh, I was working with um, Malcolm, and um, he said that uh, you know it'd be a good idea to record them in Paris in a nightclub. So that's what I was doing in Paris. And uh, in that period, I was also producing for a French label, Barclay Records, and uh, there were several projects under that umbrella which were kind of drawing me closer to the idea of working in the kind of the artistic role again. So I started to germinate this idea of um, coming up with a pseudonym, which would um, be suitable and kind of reflect where I felt um, the direction of things was going at the time. And that's it. So I was really kind of um, in Paris developing all my kind of ideas. The inspiration was, Coming down, um, coming down that way. So you called it M. What was the reason for that? Any, any uh, specific? <laughs> it's a very, okay, it's very simple. It was in fact, uh, it was at the point when the, the single prior to pop music was called Modern Man, and I was working with um, a designer called Jean Baptiste Mondino, who went on to do a lot of videos for um, a lot of notable acts, including Madonna and various other people. But he, formerly, he was a photographer. He was also a sleeve designer. And I was working in his studio. And we had almost finished or completed the sleeve. And I just said, look, I've, I have this feeling that I don't want to put it out under my, my own name. I'd like to you know, come up with a pseudonym. So it's a kind of project where I could have different uh, musicians kind of working in a uh, studio kind of um, environment. And um, I looked out the window. And I saw the M over the metro. And I thought, that's it. I'll take that. That makes a lot of sense. I was thinking it's either a James Bond influence or A through L were already taken. All right, that was terrible. <laughs> there are lots of inter- interpretations. Um, uh, M, the Moon did Fritz Lang film. I mean, there's there's all kind of interpretations, spins on that one. But it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And that's, that, that appealed to me that it was open to interpretation. People could project their own sort of thoughts on it. That was good. I read that modern men was muddled after, or let's say about a yuppie, which was pretty much a big thing around then and later on in the 80s. Yes, the upwardly, what was it, upwardly mobile generation. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of the former hippies became yuppies, I guess, huh? (laughs) That's how it works. That's right, exactly, yeah. But your breakthrough hit, Pop Music, came in 1979, which not only became a new wave classic, but it was a commentary, or at least seemed to be a commentary on corporate popular music of the time. Something very different from what you've done in the past, obviously. Yeah, I guess in in a way it was a fairly cynical take on, um, if you like, uh, the industry. But at the same time, it was a way that I was able to kind of pay homage to my sort of developing years and uh, the the music that has influenced me. And um, that was, uh, you know, at that point, I think it began as, I think most people would agree, that kind of 1954 was about the moment when that sort of 
the new era of pop music as we knew it then was beginning. And so it was it was kind of 25 years by 79. I was just thinking, okay, I'm going to sort of reflect on this. And this is my sort of manifesto, if you like. This is my sort of statement. I'm going to sum it up with this track. Well, let's break it down for a little bit. First off, I enjoyed the secret agent look in the video, along with the flashy DJ. That was, that was definitely all about the late 70s and early 80s. The... F- Former seemed to be something you incorporated in future videos as well, but back to the pop music video. I love the commentary because you had the seemingly disinterested robotic studio singer, the, the models as well. And at the end, you're passing and throwing away some of the vinyl records at the end. Sometimes I, I'm thinking that commentary about commercialized music and overconsumption of uh, music that's become a science is more relevant today now in the age of autotune. Well, that's true. And uh, Moonlight and Muzak was uh, a kind of, I was tipping my hat to that organization that was using music as a means of kind of controlling the behavior of people. At the Muzak organization, I visited them in the States and I found that quite intriguing. And that was, that's what I was alluding to in, in that song. It was, um, yeah, it was an interesting period. It certainly was, um, something was, Something was changing and something was becoming, some, there was something kind of insidious about communications in general uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the freedom uh, that we perhaps enjoyed before we had to provide, you know, so much information with regard to identity, ID, this is, you know, like the big issue. And um, that kind of uh, movement in the consciousness of popular consciousness was something which I was tapping into. The M Project is known as, in America, it's known as a one-hit wonder. And I, I never really, really liked that name because a lot of so-called one-hit wonders were international successes. They were they were huge other places or did chart again in the in here in the States, as a matter of fact. You did chart a lot with, uh, with M a few singles later on. Obviously, it was very difficult to match the success of pop music, but for the next few albums with M... What were you looking at? Were you looking to try to f- come up with something bigger? I'm pretty sure the, the record companies wanted you to, but were you trying to do that or kind of stretch out from that a little bit more? No, with, with pop music, it was, um, uh, yeah, I, w- I was determined to kind of crack the kind of commercial, um, you know, find a commercial key to with an idea. And that was, you know, it was very obvious in that sense. Um, after that, I, I felt that I then had the freedom really to kind of pursue whatever musical avenue that I was interested in. I wasn't conscious of trying to repeat myself or do the same again. It wasn't, I mean, there's so much great music that's out there, which we don't hear about. It's not sort of charting. It's not kind of enjoying commercial success and pleasing corporate entities like you know the labels and stuff but it's still great music and that's you know whether you call it left field or you call it underground or whatever certainly that was i was preoccupied with investigating and learning and discovering music in in a way which was um rewarding for me personally it wasn't about you know pleasing the cash registers or the labels or maintaining a kind of uh the turnover of and the expectations of of those that were running the business. Pop music was just, if you like, it was, it was, uh, it was designed to do what it did. The M project breaks up and I know you say that there's a lot of music out there and I'm pretty sure you had that attitude back in the early eighties as well. And might that have brought you to Africa shortly afterward? Well, I went to, I was in the privileged position of being able to, or being able to afford to travel and, experience different cultures and we spent some time in Africa and I was just blown away by the the musicianship and the the richness of um, music on the African continent. It's just extraordinary and none of this was surfacing um, in the West in a significant way at all. So it was, if you like, it was was an effort to bring it into the mainstream and sure enough that was borne out with, um, you know, the the efforts of Paul Simon and Graceland and indeed Michael McLaren, who did his bit there, we all wanted to sort of, you know, demonstrate that um, there was uh, there were great imaginative players and strains of music that were um, rich and plentiful in, in the states, uh, in the um, in the in the African um, uh, territories. 
You tried to produce an album in the early 80s, Jive Shakisha. Yes, um, Jive Shakisha. Shakisha was the name of a, a trio, three girls, who came from South Africa, in fact. And um, I met them in London. They were performing in a nightclub in London, and they were just performing their indigenous sort of folk music. And uh, I was knocked, to, knocked away with their, their vocals. I just thought it was quite extraordinary, their performance. And we struck up a relationship, and we started writing together. So it was a kind of Anglo-African project, if you like. And uh, we put together most of the material. Then I took out, um, I took uh, the backing tracks and went to Nairobi and worked with lots of musicians there. So I was to and froing quite a lot. So we had this, um, yeah, we had this uh, opportunity to to cross over. Um, there was an issue because two of the girls actually came from South Africa and when it came to doing the promotion of the videos, I couldn't take them with me to Kenya because they had South African passports because at the time there was this you know, issue over what was taking place uh, you know, on the political front in South Africa and they weren't allowing... Um, yeah, you know, people from South Africa with South African passports to go into Kenya. So it rather it started to create problems for us. And in fact, you know, that the release of that album was frustrated for many years. There were a number of complications which, you know, were down to kind of sort of certain political issues which were it was extremely frustrating because it was one of the most enjoyable albums I've ever recorded. But the background to it, you know, it was um it was complicated. You finally got it released about a decade and a half later. What did it take to finally get yeah. that done? Uh, well, basically, um, uh, you know, I had to take it upon myself to um, put that together because in at the time there was um, a deal that was proposed by Virgin Records. <clears throat> um, it was a small, yeah, it, one one of their sort of um, ethnic departments or whatever, but. Um, they kind of walked away from all the issues that were surrounding the recordings and you know anything contentious they didn't want to they let go of it how much of an influence robin has ethnic music been to your longtime songwriting library uh, i listen to a lot of music i'm very eclectic in my taste um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's only good and bad music those are the two categories and <laughs> i have a very kind of broad taste Robin Scott is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Fast forward to 2017, you released Emotional DNA, a somewhat career-spanning genre-fluid album, moving from some dance style with the remixes, a modern folk rock, some pop sensibility, a hint of reggae on one track, and a good amount of guitar. How long was this album in the making, Robin? Um, that um, It was over a period of a couple of years as I was kind of exploring the possibility of revisiting um, the kind of singer-songwriter genre, if you like, but surfacing with something which kind of, with my sort of production hat on as well. So I wanted to kind of feel comfortable with the content as well as um, the form. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it came together and uh, I'm quite interested in the idea of maybe even delivering uh, some of that material just in purely acoustic form, because I think the um, yeah the strength of obviously the song is that if it can stand alone with just simply the voice and guitar, then you know it has something to say. And it's very easy to dress things up and you know add production values and all this kind of thing. But um, I'm interested in also stripping things right back, and so I'm kind of looking at the possibility of doing that. And indeed the the track which I want to release next from the album, there is a, an earlier version of that which is very um, very acoustic by comparison to the finished production on the album. That track is Wake Up Call, and uh, you've been releasing singles from the album sporadically since its release last year. Yes. The idea is you're going to put out Wake Up Call and uh, have sort of a, a different version, maybe uh, the more acoustic-like version uh, on the, let's say, B-side, for lack of a better term, these days. Is that uh, correct? Exactly. Yeah, it'll be, yeah, it'll be a kind of double, double release, really, yes. 
Let's talk about some of the other tracks on the album, Robin. Uh, we're going to play House of Cards pretty soon. That's uh, That is kind of a little bit of an upbeat start to it, but uh, it does tell an interesting story. Uh, well, I suppose in, to, to some degree it's kind of, it reflects the same concerns that uh, I was having during the sort of uh, the the days of um, the M conspiracy, if you like. <laughs> um, we're all. <laughs> so it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I think the lyrics very much speak for themselves. Robin Scott is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Some of the other tracks, uh, uh, Wilderness, uh, Only Human, Defying Gravity. Also, you have a couple of dance remixes, uh, My Rescue Me- Remedy. Those are more reflective of, I'd say, the uh, the new wave dance stuff, but most of the other music on the album would uh, would look to be the singer-songwriter aspect. Yeah, the um, that particular track, um, uh, Rescue Remedy, was... Um... Uh, there was a remixer that offered to um, do some work on that, and I was fairly open to that. So that was the result. I didn't, um, I didn't really have um, too much uh, involvement with that. I just gave him the, yeah, gave him the masters and let him um, produce his own interpretation. With this album, Emotional DNA, what would you like its listeners to learn most about you as a musician, Robin? The uh, the clue is in the title, really. I think that what um, I was kind of exploring was um, ways of getting to the roots of my own personal baggage, if you like, <laughs> which I was exploring, you know, where I was coming from emotionally and the fact that I feel that we all have this kind of unique kind of... Uh, fingerprint if you like of um of who we are that's that's what makes us who we are you know we kind of um the way we sort of interact with the world is very much influenced by our own personal journey you know it's nature or nurture and that's what i was referring to robin i wish you great luck with this album and of course the uh, new single house of cards which we're going to be playing and the upcoming single wake up call i want to thank you again for being with us on revenge of the 80s radio you're welcome thank you very much to keep up with robin check him out on twitter facebook and your website robinscott.uk robin let's play a track from emotional dna recently released as a single house of cards on revenge of the 80s radio <laughs> 